Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. Good. Excellent. That's always an awkward question at the beginning of speech because there's no way I could possibly ask you each individually how you are. But I hope you're well, and I thank you for joining me today. I'm going to run through some slides. I have a short video to play in the midst of this. And <clears throat> I guess I want to just express at the offset of my comments that, um, and I'm not sure if, uh, are you guys, can you hear me OK? Yeah? Everybody good? Um, Trying to speak to the topic of giving a voice to the voiceless is somewhat of a daunting task. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was thoughtful in how I put this presentation together because though the title is Women in Media and Entertainment, the issue really pertains to all of us. Um, that is trying to find more of a balance in terms of the genders who are participating in leadership in media and entertainment in all of the industries that drive every aspect of the uh, motion picture studio, broadcast television network, sports production network, and related um, industries. So just wanted to give you that disclaimer before I started, uh, started down my uh, presentation. Um, first, I wanted to just give you a little quick bio about myself. I think Julia's kind of covered where I am now, Elemental, which is arguably the most exciting startup in multi-screen video processing on the planet. I feel very lucky to be there. Super cool company in Portland. Downtown, which is the first time I've been there actually in a long time. Um, attended OSU about a million years ago. Um, worked for the Barometer, worked for uh, KBVR TV, which is hopefully content that none of you will ever, 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 ever see. Um, was a member of the Society of Professional uh, Journalists, Sigma Delta Chi, which was great because it was a great networking opportunity with lots of different pros when we were able to go out for quarterly meetings. Had a couple of different internships, one of which was with Red Book Magazine in New York through the American Association of Magazine Editors, which was a terrific experience, again, just trying to network as much as I could. And all of that culminated in a brief stint with the Newport News Times on the Oregon coast. Um, <clears throat> which is uh, a very interesting uh, year in a lot of different ways. And then uh, took a left turn into high tech. I wanted to join the Oregonian. They had like 450 cabillion stringers and no room for me, even though they told me they liked my headlines and how I wrote my leads. And so I uh, started working for a company called Floating Point Systems, um, which was a manufacturer of super fast parallel processing devices. One of which is pictured up there. It's roughly the size of like a Buick um, and can go probably not quite as fast as a 20-year-old computer now. Uh, then off to Tektronics and Mentor Graphics. So um, really tried to parlay the technical journalism degree that I earned here and the um, application that I was able to um, benefit from through the barometer and through KBVR into a career in technology that I never expected to be in. Um, and frankly, the, the ability to figure out what the story was, to take highly technical information, explain it clearly in a compelling way, um, uh, was based on skills that I gained here and that I've been able to parlay into almost a 30-year career in high technology, um, so, and even starting my own company. So I can assure you that whatever direction you decide to go with the skills that you're getting here at Oregon State, in media and communications, whether it's in professional journalism, in media and entertainment, into marketing. Um, it's, it's an extraordinarily useful skill set. Um, went from uh, my kind of pure tech experience, and mentor graphics, where we were helping the world be a better place for uh, our software that we use to design ASICs and other kinds of chips, into the broadcast industry through Tektronics, of all places. Tech had a video division and a company associated with it called Grass Valley. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Grass Valley Gear. It's a pretty storied brand in acquisition and production and television. So spent about a year there, and then our parent company announced at NAB that they were selling us. And we went on to work for a French company called Thompson, which also owned Technicolor. I was able to spend a, a few months uh, living and working in LA, LA and the ins and outs of Technicolor and the studio and post-production market and then continued to um, drive marketing communications um, as vice president globally for Thompson Systems Division, even though I was based in Portland. I was commuting to Paris and Kobe, Japan, and elsewhere for about 10 years, um, and was able in the middle of it to uh, 
be blessed with the arrival of my daughter, Sophia, who's joining us here today, too. So all of that to say that I, I, I kept finding myself, you know, in a state of surprise that I ended up in the broadcast industry, that I was able to take the skills from these journalism courses that I participated in here in the practicum through the barometer and KBVR, and again, parlayed into a very useful career um, that enabled me to um, raise a child, start a family, and start a business. So any questions about career, et cetera, all clear? The common thread in all of this, um, again, was the ability to be an interpreter and a gap closer. So um, taking the skills that you learn about how to identify a story or how to identify a creative angle for a production is going to um, enable you to help um, people who are technologists or people who are trying to market a product um, or perhaps a news you know, producer um, figure out a way to um, link the key point of the story with the target audience. And it's, if I'm stumbling around here, it's because I'm trying to think of a way to express this so that it's relevant to a journalistic career. It's also relevant to a business career. I can tell you as a marketing professional that that ability to link the, the triangle between business need, technological capability, and consumer's desired outcome is absolutely key. And the communication skills that you're learning here are going to help, um, help you realize that. So the ability to create a clear, compelling story and the common thread that you're going to pull through that story um, and you know, hopefully the result's going to be increased revenue for your company, increased readership, increased subscriptions, increased viewers is um, you know, what's really kind of glued the many different brands I've worked together and um, the career that I've been able to build. And I've been doing that for the companies that I talked about with target audiences who happen to represent some of the biggest brands in the media and entertainment industry. So I've been very fortunate to work with extremely talented, bright technologists at Warner Brothers, Comcast, HBO, and what have you. People who have really shaped the transition of the media industry from analog to digital, digital to HD, HD to that science experiment called 3D, and now into some really spectacular capabilities through multi-screen uh, display of, um, of, of video and also some enhanced viewing opportunities through things like 4K. Um, so very fortunate along the way. <clears throat> so the common theme was you know, pulling the thread, learning how to put together the story so that it would be um, clear, compelling, memorable, leveraging the skills that I gained here to do so, practicing it over and over again, the 10,000 hour rule, and uh, learning how to quickly learn what was most important to all of these different um, end users so that I would enable my company to frankly be the best in the industry, to be number one in sales across a variety of different segments or to have you know, number one coverage or what have you. So the other common theme in all of this was that um, I was usually one of very few women who were working in this field. When I'd travel to France, I'd be the one woman in the boardroom, or, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, um, or the one woman in, you know, at the management team meeting or what have you. And it, that's not an uncommon scenario. Um, so let me just talk about the, the elephant in the room, as it were, which um, basically is... Um, I think the industry's perception or the industry's um, need to do a reality check that women simply don't right now in media and entertainment leadership or in the industries that serve media and entertainment brands full or fair representation of females um, and for, for a variety of reasons. Um, we're not seeing very many women in the role of media enterprise owner um, in the role of actual newsmaker, even in the role of being the subject of news content. And I'll share some numbers with you in a bit. But um, part of the issue in the elephant in the room, um, should actually probably be elephants in the room, is not just the fact that um, um, you know, women don't have as much of a presence as, as men do in this field, but that a lot of the time the way in, or the manner in which women are represented in content is through a hypersexualized 
um, approach, which it makes it very difficult for women to advance. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, too, which I think is really pretty curious, and it's um, what I call an inverse rule. Um, more women than men graduate from mass communications and journalism programs in the United States. But um, in terms of career focus, many of those women simply don't pursue the career. And again, you know, the idea that there are some role models that are making it difficult for women to feel like they're being taken seriously in the field or they're not getting a role, place at the table um, has been a big factor in all of this. So I wanted to share with you, and I don't, have any of you seen the trailer or the movie called Misrepresentation? Does that sound familiar? YouTube, you've seen it? Have you seen the whole thing or just bits of it? So you'll be a bit bored, but you'll put up with watching it one more time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard not to. Yeah. So misrepresentation actually um, was a is a film that was made by a woman named Jennifer Lynn Siebel, who's married to the former mayor of San Francisco, now lieutenant governor of California. And she's a, a filmmaker and an actress. This um, actually premiered on Oprah's network on OWN about two years ago. And it really was created and is still being used to help um, expose how media influences, you know, this hypersexualization, if you will, or representation of women in media and some other pretty gross generalizations are actually becoming the driving forces behind the values of young girls, people like my child, people like you, your sisters, and what have you. Um, so I wanted to just, uh, again, share this with you. It's going to take about eight minutes to get through. And then um, I will come back with some more comments. And let me know if this isn't. OK, I can get those lights again. What do you guys think? Any feedback on that? An awkward question to ask after watching that, probably. But I was pretty. I thought that was a very impactful piece, and I think, um, you know, I don't want to come across as wanting to malign. First, I have to find my presentation here again. I don't want to malign the media because I think the media can do a lot of really good things. I mean, and I think there's a huge amount of opportunity to affect some positive change that can probably address some of the gross misrepresentation of women um, that's taking place in the media today, and also balance the scales a bit more in terms of who's uh, feeling like they can actually take part in the, um, in the industry. Um, the reality is, though, that, um, you know, and I need to forward my slides here. Sorry, got all caught up. Okay, yeah, I got it. There we go. Right there, will that work? Yeah. Um, but the media is the message, um, it's the messenger, and the result of the message is that women not only are being adversely affected by rather narrowly defined definition of who they are, narrowly scoped definition of who they are, or portrayal of who they are, they're not even trying to apply for the jobs in some cases, which I think is really sad. And the end result is a lost, what I call a lost opportunity cost, because half of the the, you know, there's a lot of brain power that's not being tapped into. There's a lot of creative energy. There are a lot of ideas that simply aren't coming to the table. So, um, you know, media, it's pers media is persuasive. It's persistent. It's prevalent. It can be very good. Um, but we need to try to work to fix, redirect some of the more negative messaging that um, has been taking place around women. Um, the video that we just watched um, shared some numbers, but I wanted to go through a few other numbers because, again, as I was getting ready for my comments today, <clears throat> I was even surprised about how significant these are. And many of these are reported um, within the last, I'd say, 12 to 18 months. So this isn't old data. You know, this isn't coming from the earlier part of the 21st century. 3% um, is the number that you saw, and that refers to the number of women who are in top tier positions in media and entertainment companies. This is like Ann Sweeney at Disney ABC Network. 90% um, refers to the percentage of men who are working as sports media editors, columnists, and reporters. 10% in the sports industry are women right now. 
Um, 15 percent is the number that you saw up there. Actually, I think they said 18 percent in terms of women who are involved as directors or editors or producers or executive producers for, major, uh, for theatrical release or major motion picture um, releases. Um, uh, in terms of news stories that actually featured women that have been produced since 2011, 24 percent. The rest were about men. And I don't want to mean to ostracize you guys, but I, just, I was just really struck. I could not believe these numbers. Um, percentage of women guests on Sunday morning news talk shows is at 13.5 percent. So the rest of the conversation is being conducted by the guys. Um, this one was a, a shocker. In fact, I was talking to Sophia about it in the car on the way down here, which is that the, the percentage of female speaking characters in G-rated movies between 1990 and 2005 and in the 100 top grossing films in the last five years were um, represented, actually the, the percentage was 33. So 33 percent of all the characters and all the G-rated movies released in that period of time were women. The rest were, were male, were female. So uh, last couple percentages, 6% women own broadcast TV stations in the U.S. and 75% the number of, um, <coughs> or rather the percentage of male news or cable news um, anchors in the U.S. And then the last number there, the 10 plus, refers to the same figure that you saw in this video, which is the number of hours on average that kids are consuming media every day. So this not only is the message of hypersexuality, but the message of kind of MIA um, is also being reinforced um, in a pretty regular um, and pretty intensive basis with people who frankly have the opportunity to shape the industry going forward. Um, Katie Couric was the um, first woman to solo anchor a weekday news program. I think she did that, what, 2006 to summer of 2011. And then the ratings um, were, you know, cited and, and she and, and CBS parted ways. But I thought that um, her comment um, was pretty insightful. Um, she is one of a number of people who, along with Ann Sweeney, um, are continuing to really try to promote, and Ann Sweeney again is the head of Disney, um, co-chairman of Disney, try to promote um, inclusion of more women at the table, more women um, in a leadership and decision-making position at some of these major uh, media enterprises. So, um, and I should have stayed on here for just a second, the headline or the title that I gave the slide was Aim High. And um, I'm going to give you guys just a few kind of walk-away ideas. Um, because I, I think it's important that men and women both try to, um, who are coming from communications programs, coming with journalism degrees, um, aim as high as possible in their aspirations in a professional media enterprise or in a corporation where they might work, such as Nike or Intel or wherever, in marketing capacities. Um, and, and not be dismayed by the numbers and not be dismayed by um, the presence of any one demographic group of people. Aim high, stay focused, um, use the skills that you've uh, been trained with here. 10,000 hours refers to the generally accepted rule of thumb about what defines an expert. You've probably heard this before. A really good pilot, an expert writer, an expert technologist are going to have put in at least 10,000 hours of um, effort, focused effort in their area of study or in their area of practical um, application. Um, one of the things that I think has benefited me over the course of the last, you know, 25 to 30 years is the fact that I stayed focused on an industry. I didn't hopscotch too much. Um, and I think that that has enabled me to, um, frankly, start my own small business. It's enabled me to ascend uh, despite some of the demographic challenges. And the women who I've pictured here are representative of, though the, you know, the, the, the percentage may be small, the women who are working in media entertainment are doing some pretty amazing things. Um, and these are what I'd call um, members of the 10,000 Hour Club. These are women who have dedicated their careers um, to the media and entertainment industry and usually to um, one or two employers. So focus is key, aiming high is key. And just some titles to run through here. 
um, CEO of NEP Broadcasting. NEP is one of the biggest mobile production van companies that you'll see around. They'll come to some of your games here, do all of the outside broadcast or mobile production work. Um, producer, director, CBS Sports. Um, Executive Vice President and Chief Video and Content Officer at Time Warner. <coughs> Business Legal Affairs, Fox Cable Networks. Um, COO Telemundo. Executive Vice President of Content Distribution Marketing at Viacom. Um, SVP of Original Programming and General Manager of Disney Junior Worldwide. So again, the, the, and I'm saying this to be encouraging, though the numbers are gloomy um, in terms of how few women there are working in the field, those who are, who have made it to senior management are in positions of really significant influence. Um, so aim high, become a 10,000 hour expert, stay focused, and embrace numbers. And I'm going to make a gross assumption here, and I apologize to those of you who I might offend with this comment, but um, uh, generally speaking, I did not find myself as a communications major, as a technical journalism major, despite the appellation of my title, is particularly drawn to mathematics or any kind of number. Um, and uh, I, <clears throat> again, maybe I'm grossly simplifying um, my assumption of what all of you are pursuing in terms of study, because there may be some combined majors in here and what have you. But the ability to combine communication skills with sharp analytic skills, sharp financial analytic skills and forecasting skills is an unbeatable combination in a media and entertainment enterprise or really in any marketing enterprise um, because you're going to be able to um, convince people to increase budgets, to make a spend, to invest in a program, to invest in a new product line, to invest in a new program or new content. So um, though the numbers may be off-putting or maybe you do love the numbers, but make sure that you combine the communication skills that you're getting here with those because it, again, is, a, is an unbeatable combination. A great example of that is Kung Fu Panda 2. Um, it's also a great example of a woman who has embraced numbers um, and her creative vision. Her name is Jennifer U. Nelson. She helped make DreamWorks 637,000, or excuse me, $637 million based on the launch of this movie. It's one of the most successful top grossing films directed by a woman in 2012. And a good example of embracing creativity and numbers. Um, just to kind of continue the thought, um, the Hollywood Reporter every year assesses the 100 most powerful women in entertainment, largely women who work in Hollywood. Um, and I wanted to cite these women too as um, examples of, again, a small percentage but incredibly powerful people um, and people who are bringing together creative vision, financial acumen, and technology savvy to secure and to lead media enterprises that are super significant. And some of those include, as I mentioned before, Ann Sweeney, who's the co-chair of Disney Media Networks. Um, she started out life as a teacher. She's now the head of Disney, basically. Um, in charge of a $19 billion operation, growing almost 8% year over year. Donnie Hammer, who's chairman of NBC Univers Universal Cable, uh, 12 months of revenue at $4 billion, profits of $2 billion, up 5%. Biggest single contributor to NBC Universal's bottom line. Amy Pascal is co chair of Sony Pictures Entertainment. $4 billion annually, number one studio in market share. Skyfall is her cl uh, claim to fame at $800 million gross. A.B. Raven, uh, president and CEO of AE Networks, a company is valued at $20 billion, projected revenue of $3.5 billion. And Nina Tassler at CBS Entertainment, which doesn't release numbers, but I can tell you is the most watched television network for nine years in the U.S. So these are all women who have been able to break through the glass ceiling have combined focus, <clears throat> dedication to the media and entertainment sector, creative vision, financial acumen, and technology savvy to proceed um, and to win. A friend of mine, uh, Wendy Aylesworth, is the Senior Vice President of Technical Operations for Warner Brothers. And I cite Wendy as a really shining example because she um, was trained as a music major, took a left turn into some mathematical studies, 
and ended up designing anti-submarine um, software for Lockheed Martin and then worked for Disney, which I thought was a really pretty amazing series of achievements. She ended up at Warner Brothers, and she's been, able to, she's been the person behind the readying of um, theaters around the world for digital cinema projection. And she's the person who's worked with um, Peter Jackson's release of The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey in 4K, which is really going to replace 3D as an option for the next kind of uh, advance you're going to see in viewing. And she's been the person behind worldwide theatrical readiness for 4K. Again, a great example of a woman who's broken through the glass ceiling, who's stuck with it. She's been with Warner Brothers for about 15 years now and has been able to take a liberal arts background and parlay it into a very sound and lucrative technology career. So the biggest instrument of change is going to be you. And I hate to put the burden on you, but, um, you know, I look forward to hearing about your contributions to the media and entertainment industry. I look forward to hearing about how you're able to harness media, which is an incredibly powerful instrument of change, and to um, help find ways to positively influence the portrayal of women in media, to help women feel more welcome in media, or to at least offer advances um, and opportunities where they haven't been before, and to basically make a choice between maintaining status quo or awakening people and changing minds, influencing positive change through your own good example, moving fluidly between art, finance, and technology, weaving that strong communications thread that you're taught to do here, and to also keep a healthy balance. So it's a lot of hard work. Um, it's easy to lose yourself in your job. I did that for 10 years. Don't advise it. Um, you want to wake up at the end of your successful career with your family still intact. So strongly, uh, strongly advise that one too. And that's about it. That's all I've got. Slams the door, you know, literally. Well, I mean, not really, but um, it's literally a signature of the time. Uh, but in a job, would you apply for something or want something that someone tells you no, it's just a no? To educate myself. Um, the, I think one of the most important things you can do, male or female, in any work environment is to gain what I call full situational awareness. The world's a highly political place, and you need to make sure you understand, number one, you know, what, obviously, what are the goals of this organization? What are the operational goals? What are the financial goals? But then what's everybody else's agenda, frankly? You know, and why is it their agenda? I, I call it putting myself in my boss's boss's shoes, you know. Um, so being, um, being very mindful of your environment, being very well informed and mindful of um, the influences and aspirations of those around you, and also doing something kind of strange. And that's uh, if you have a you know your project you're working on, maybe the door was slammed in your face as a result of your project concept or your production, you know your your, pro your content programming approach or what have you. Throw it away. Say, yep, let's trash that one. Let's let's find something new to do. Your willingness to show your team that you can dump an idea says a lot about your credibility, and it, it shows that you're courageous, you're confident. You're willing to try something new. So that's pretty much how I'd work around it. Does that help? Yeah? Okay. Well, what can our men do? And I think that that might be an important question. Nobody else is asking in the room, but I'd like to know what the idea is for our men. So if, if they are the 75% leading these companies. I mean, frankly, being overt about opening the door and offering potential. I mean, that sounds a little, it's a bit unfair. But because the scales are tipped so heavily in favor of men, in, especially in media and entertainment, you know, being willing to offer an opportunity to um, a well-deserving, talented woman when she may not normally get that invitation, I think, is, a, is very helpful. Um, being mindful of, uh, you know, 
the representation of women, you know, of, of your own perception of women or, you know, your, the role that you might play in helping um, create a less stereotypical, hypersexualized image of women if you find yourself in the role of being a director for a commercial or a creative launch program for a major, um, you know, clothing designer. You know, you have the option to go, take creative in a different direction. So choosing that option. Be good. One of the things I found shocking was that um, you know, Miss Disney's head was a woman, and yet 33% of the characters are women. So yeah. would that relate? Would, would she have a role in that? Well, I mean, I'm glad you said that because I, well, I appreciate the question about what men can do. I really think the question is what can we all do? Um, you know, Anne Sweeney, frankly, and a lot of these other women who are in leadership positions across the industry have the opportunity to make the same choice. Um, and it's more than just people in media and entertainment. It's people who are involved in all of the attendant industries, advertising, uh, consumer goods, you know, from the cars you choose to drive and the shoes you choose to wear to the technology that you, you know, decide to use. So there has to be, I think, um, a galvanizing force, and perhaps some of that comes from, you know, more women at the top, but, you know, I think, I think there has to be a very overt effort to, to move away from some of the imagery that we see today. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts from the student's perspective of when you see that misrepresentation and you've been, you've grown up with that in your face, how does that, how do you guys feel like that affects you? None taken. It's okay. <laughs> Do you think people just don't even see it anymore? I agree with that. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot it's to like that. Yeah. Oh no, I think I think there's culpability on all sides. Yeah, so, definitely. You know, I honestly do not know the answer to that question, but I will know once I've watched the entire movie. I was just really taken with the trailer. That's the other thing in your career is total honesty. Always use it. It's a great tool, and it's super disarming for people. But anyhow, yeah. She does get in trouble with that. Yeah. So the question is, um, is there truth to the perception or the discussion point that women decide to walk away from careers so that they can start a family and they can, um, I guess, you know, have children start a family is basically the question, right? Um, I mean, I think there's, I think there's, there's anecdotal um, evidence of behaviors both ways. I mean, I. We'll use myself as an example. Maybe you want to use yourself as an example too. But um, I was really bad. I mean, I worked until the day my daughter was born. I mean, I literally had to end a conference call saying, I'm sorry, I have to go give birth now. <laughs> I did. And then I you know, gave birth, and I started working three days afterward, which is not advisable. I was a bit of a workaholic. Um, I do. I was talking to a friend of mine who founded a technology company in Portland, uh, an analog design firm, and she was saying, you know, that women do walk away 
from environments because companies, whether they're media enterprises, dairies, or sports franchises, just haven't really gotten their act together in terms of really developing a family-friendly, work-life balance-friendly kind of environment. And I can attest to that. I mean, it's, you know, you get a lot of lip service when you go into any entity. Yes, you know, of course, you may nurse your child here. You, you, will, you, know, you can have a paternity leave and a maternity leave. But when a lot of the time people really start walking in and they get into their jobs, management becomes more uh, attuned to deadline pressures, making milestones, and it all kind of goes out the window. So I think there's a lot of truth to the fact that women are making choices to walk away because um, they aren't able to, and, and maybe some men too, you know, in, in families where women decide to have the child and the man decides to stay home and he's not encouraged to do that either. So it is definitely a factor. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Any other questions? Anybody else want to answer that question around how it's affecting you, or if you think it is affecting you? I, I happen to play sports in this area. Uh, I'm on for content. And unfortunately, what everybody sees in the media is a very sexualized version of it. And so to try to promote that and to promote what it really is about as opposed to I just want to make sure I understand your question. So you're finding that, and is this a sport you wish to pursue professionally? I am currently in it right now. You're in it professionally. And we have such a backlash with the public mm -hmm. because it has been over-sexualized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, gosh, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, it, this is the kind of, you know, it, it's the sort of thing that you'd want to pull maybe a strategic public relations agency in on or what have you, but I'll give you my opinion. Um, and I, I think um, off the cuff, that sometimes humor is the best way to combat major misperception. You might take a Mythbusters based approach to whatever sport this is. And, and call people out, just call up the 10 most ridiculous things that anybody has ever said to you about this sport, you know, gross generalization or, you know, misunderstanding or whatever it is, and then debunk it. And maybe use that as the basis of some sort of creative communications campaign that you handle through social media or through your website or through some other kind of promotion that would be associated with it. I don't know if that's very helpful or not, but... But sometimes, again, it's just total honesty. It's like, yeah, you know, here are the 10 most ridiculous things I've ever heard, and I'm just going to help you understand why that's pretty silly thinking. You don't even know what sport it is. Women's tackle football. I mean, on last Wednesday, Kim Gillard News, we bring in Jay Petron. Mm-hmm. No, you're going to have an uphill battle, no question. But, um, but take it in stride, take it with humor. And I should have had a slide on humor because that really is key too in, in a lot of this is to, in that whole healthy balance thing. But anyhow. Okay. Oh, yeah? And um, one of the things I found was I was more on the development side, mm -hmm. but uh, there weren't that many women on the development side either. Mm -hmm. So when you say that men should, like, you said both like women and men should take that responsibility to mm -hmm. have the open door for mm -hmm. women and hire more. Mm -hmm. They also, when I was up there, they were looking for developers, and no one was even taking the spot. And so when I was, ended up being, most of the women there were all secretarial positions, mm -hmm. and 
there was any spot for women to, there's a one woman, uh, woman on our team, but uh, that was pretty much it for the rest of the company. Yeah. There wasn't that many spots. So and then, was that in Beaverton? <laughs> Mm -hmm. But then there's no one to fill that sometimes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a fair point. And, you know, it's interesting. You're a good st straight man. Um, because I brought down another video. I'm not going to show it to you, but it will be available. And it's um, by a woman named Davy Stevenson, who I work with at Elemental Technologies. She is one of the most brilliant software programmers I've ever met. Amazing. Um, working in Ruby Rails, working in a whole bunch of, you know, all this um, stuff that I don't even begin to understand. But she's, she's been key in developing a lot of the next generation software for Elemental. And she talks a lot about um, what motivated her as a woman to become a programmer. Um, there's an effort afoot, a it's called STEM. Um, and it's a program that's intended to motivate more young women to become involved in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You've probably heard of STEM. And, um, and I think um, Wendy, in fact, Wendy Ellsworth, the woman who I spoke about briefly in here, in a couple of different pieces, if you Google her, you'll see her talking about this, talks about the importance of um, helping young women who for some reason, and again, I don't mean to share a gross generalization, but it is true that there are just not very many women involved in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, so really try to help them not feel a, a sense of fear or maybe instead of looking at it from a sense of fear perspective, try to help them find a sense of artistry or creativity that's associated with these different disciplines because they are tremendously creative. I think they've just been given kind of a very um, programmatic, um, you know, MO, so to speak. Does that yeah. jibe with what you're saying? I think... Um, I, I, I'm really sorely tempted to put my daughter on the spot, but she would murder me in the car on the way home, and that would be ugly, so I won't. <laughs> but I was going to just say, you know, I think um, there are, um, I know at her school at least, there's more of a concerted effort to make science and math accessible to young women. There's an awareness that, you know, there need to be additional steps taken to uh, make them feel comfortable with the coursework or to follow through an application or what have you. So I think it has to start early. Okay, you guys good? Okay, killed you with kindness here. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate you coming. <laughs>